Okay, so um, so thank you for the introduction and also thank you very much for the invitation to give the tutorial here. Um, I was really hoping that by this time we would be able to all gather in um, Gdansk, um, but there we go. Um, and, um, and as you say, it does make things easier to travel around. So I'm going to give a tutorial today on the use of um, quantum theory in natural language processing, which, um, which we also call NLP. I'll probably just say NLP the whole time. Um, and for this audience, I'm going to assume that you're all more familiar with quantum theory than with NLP. Um, so I'm just I'm going to be focusing kind of more explanatorily on the NLP side than the quantum side. So what is natural language processing and why are we interested in it? Well, many of us interact with computers every day and we often do that using something like natural language. Um, so when I say something like natural language, I mean, I mean there's, there's things like when we talk to Siri or Alexa or when we just type queries into Google um, and then there's even kind of using programming languages and so on and sort of stuff we're, we're trying to communicate with the computer via the medium of language and we want a computer to be able to do things like maybe make inferences from what we're saying another task which is very common now is translation um, natural language understanding we might want the computer to understand what we're saying and then take some action depend uh, depending on that and um, and also come kind of come up with answers to questions um, and the study of natural language processing, sort of how to represent language um, uh, in a way that computers can do these tasks is, um, is what we're looking at today. So what kinds of quantum phenomena are put to use in natural language processing? Well, the very first kind of basic thing is um, the kind of vector space structure that we have. So, um, in the in a in a couple of minutes, I'll talk you through how we look at um, uh, at language as um, represented within a vector space, and um, the sorts of things we can do with that. Um, so, other quantum phenomena that um, that is put to use in natural language processing are um, mixed states. So these are used to represent um, lexical ambiguity and word clusters, things like entanglement, which can represent how word meanings interact as they're being used. And I probably won't have time to talk about this, but, um, but there is also some work on contextuality, sort of human judgment and human word use. Um, that's in a uh, would be nice to talk about at the end section. Um, so we'll see if we get there. So here's the roadmap of the of the talk. I'm first I'm going to start off talking about vector space models of meaning. So um, this is going to include um, what's called distributional semantics and neural network models of meaning. Um, I'll then talk about some applications to information retrieval and question answering. And then the bulk of the talk is really going to be about compositional approaches um, in um, natural language processing. So I'm going to talk about this, um, this model DiscoCat, which um, some of you may be familiar with. So this is the categorical compositional distributional model of meaning. Um, that was pioneered by Bob Cooker, um, Manoush Sajazadeh, and Stephen Clark, and, um, and which is very much based within um, on the same theory as um, categorical quantum mechanics. Um, I'm going to talk about extensions of that to hierarchical structure and language um, and look at ambiguity and polysemy. And then only very, very quickly talk about implementation on quantum hardware, because I noticed that the talk after this one um, is going to be covering that in, in quite a lot more detail, I think. Um, it would be nice to be able to talk about implementation in, in neural networks, but I think time will not permit. I don't know, there's a, it's a big field. It's, a, it's all very interesting. And I'd, I'd love to talk about all of it, but... Um, but yeah, I'm having to narrow things down. Okay, so vector space models of meaning. 
So why do we want to, why do we even want to um, represent a word in a vector space? Well, the nice thing about representing words as vectors is that we get certain things um, built into the, the meaning space for free. So we have a notion of similarity between words um, built in. So if two, the idea is that if we have two, um, two words with similar meanings, then they ought to be close together in the vector space. You also have a kind of notion of betweenness. So if you have two um, words um, then that mean certain things, then an, a word kind of in between them ought to mean something in between the two, the two meanings. Um, we'll sort of, we'll be able to see that there are kind of clusters of similar words in a vector space and so on. So all of this kind of comes for free within this, uh, within this sort of model. How are we going to build a, um, a vector space for words? Well, um, the, the idea is um, from Firth, uh, who was writing in 1957. And also, if you want to know more details about this, I would recommend taking a look at the, um, at the uh, reference at the bottom here. So this reference, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this one. This reference here, Jurafsky and Martin, is a free book on speech and language processing. So much of um, what I'm going to say about natural language processing, you can kind of pick up from this as well. So the idea is going to be that we will build up a, um, we're going to build up a vector space of words. Um, the dimensions of the vector space are going to be individual words in the vocabulary. And we're going to assign um, we're going to assign vectors to each word based on how that word co-occurs with um, with other words in a big corpus of text. So we take a big corpus of text, and we um, and we go through uh, and count for each um, for each word that we're interested in we go through and we count how it occur how many times it occurs um, within a window a certain window of say five with other words okay and this works so so we build this so we build up at this big matrix um, it's called so the the hypothesis behind this is the distributional hypothesis um, and the idea is basically that words that appear in similar contexts are going to have similar meanings. Um, so on the other hand, given a number of contexts for the same word, we should be able to guess what word that is. So you could have a go at guessing what word is represented by this question mark. So there's one word that you could put in uh, maybe more than one, but you could choose one word that you can put in in each of these question marks to um, uh, which are going to uh, uh, which kind of fits in this context. So um, I don't know if you want to put any any answers in the in the chat. I'm just going to have a look in the chat. So Ravi says yeah. human. Any other takers? Alex says human as well. Um, oh, I'm just looking at other comments in the chat. Yes, there's something called quantum NLP, which is uh, neuro-linguistic programming, and it's completely, uh, um, yeah, so, okay, so human, so Ravi's got human, Alex has got human, anybody else have any, uh, any ideas? Well, yeah, so human, human is, uh, is uh, the right answer there. Okay, so, um, so on the on the other the other way of looking at this as well is that we can um, we can think about having um, we we can think about how to represent each word based on its on its context. So we've got here four sentences, um, all about different I, um, items, and we can see that in the case of cherry and strawberry, we see the word pie. And in the case of digital and information, we see the word computer. So, um, so which of these words are going to be most similar to each other and 
and why. So again, your chance to kind of put something in the chat. So out of cherry and strawberry, digital and information, are any of these going to be more similar to each other than, uh, than, um, than any others? So I won't, um, I won't leave it too long, but um, essentially we can, um, so let's have a look. Yeah, so again, Archipel says cherry and strawberry are going to be more similar. Cherry and strawberry share pie, whereas digital and information share computer. Um, raspberry would be trickier. Yeah, perhaps that's, uh, that's true. So, um, yeah, so essentially what we do is we go through, we count up how many times each word occurs with each other word and we, and we build up a big list. And these figures here are actual figures from the Wikipedia corpus. And then we'll see that, um, that the words digital and information have got um, counts where at least even if the magnitude of them is, is not the same, the kind of direction of those counts is the same. So if we, if we plot, for example, digital and information on a two-dimensional um, space comprised of data and computer, so data and computer were two of the basis words here, we see that they point in the same direction. And and this is what we want. So we wanted to say that words that are more similar to each other are closer together in the semantic space. And we measure similarity by cosine, usually by cosine similarity. Um, sometimes we, you can use Euclidean distance um, and there are other measures of similarity as well, but cosine, looking at the cosine of the angle between the vectors is the standard way of doing it. And if your vectors are um, already um, normalized, then this is just the inner product of the, of the two vectors. So you'll notice that we have this sort of aspect where the, these numbers can get very big. Um, on the other hand, uh, they're also the, the actual um, matrix itself is quite sparse um, because most words don't occur with other words. And so these numbers can be transformed to be more informative. Um, so there's a couple of transformations for a word-word matrix. Um, they're often transformed using something called positive pointwise mutual information. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of what that is, um, but it's just it it's essentially means that you can weight things so that very common words don't contribute so much to the direction in the space, and rarer words will. If, if you have two words that occur together um, and, and one of them is rare, then, then, we, then you get, then that becomes more highly weighted. Um, I, as I said, the, the matrix is usually very sparse as well. So um, if we think we've got a matrix um, where you've got, the words that you want to represent. So that's your whole vocabulary down, down the rows. And then the, the basis vectors, uh, which is also the, the kind of, which you also have one for each word in the vocabulary. You get this very large matrix, um, which, uh, which will be sparse. And so usually the, um, the dimension is re reduced by using um, something like singular value decomposition. Okay. So I was going to go into looking at neural methods. Um, I think there probably won't be a huge amount of time, but just to say, so this, so this idea of um, building up word meanings by counting how words co-occur with each other and then reducing the space down to some sort of manageable dimension um, is called um, distributional semantics. Um, and it has been very successful uh, for a while, um, but in recent years, it's been um, surpassed by these, these kinds of neural methods. So um, 
there's uh, we have uh, a method called word to vec. Um, if if you want me to talk more about this, um, then I can do in question time or kind of afterwards. Um, so we have uh, a method called word to vec. Um, we have recurrent methods, which are very nice because um, they kind of look at how words interact over time. Um, and then um, attention based methods as well. So I can talk more about those later if people would like. Excuse me. Yeah, it, hi. Yeah, there is, there is a question on the chat, which I find it's important because it, it, it sure. connects understanding between the formalism and the actual work with the corpora. So, so yeah. could you tell us very briefly what is the, the, the question is the following, what is the significance of number pairs? What do the digits represent? Frequencies of occurrence of words in the document or, or whatever else. So, so maybe just, just to precise again what the numbers mean. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, thank you. That's a really important question. And it's good to, um, uh, yeah, it's good to have that. So these numbers, so that we have here information 3,982. So this means that information has been seen within a kind of five word neighborhood of data. So if you take the word data and look, no, sorry, if you take the word information and look five words back and five words forward, you will find data 3,982 times within this particular corpus. And you'll find computer 3,325 times in the corpus. So, and the corpus in this case is a, um, is a download of Wikipedia. So if you go through Wikipedia um, and you um, look at, take the word information and you look around it, you'll find data and computer basically a lot of times. And similarly with digital, you'll find that it, you'll also find it a lot of times. But if we go back to um, this one here, if you take the word, um, cherry you only find the word computer within a five word window of cherry two, twice and data eight times so these um so these uh numbers here are um literally just counts counts of how often these occur and um and so because because common words uh, will then kind of overwhelm these counts. So words like the or a, um, the numbers can also be transformed to be more informative. And this is, these are some of the transformations that you can do. So I hope that, is that uh, all right for people in the chat? Yes, but I think this question we can, we can answer later. So I'm just typing it. So so please go ahead. Okay, sure. Okay, so I'm going to um, go on to talk briefly about information retrieval and question answering. So in information retrieval, um, you want to create a representation of the entities that you want to search over. So the idea is that you want to have you have a representation of entities. You need to search over them. Um, and find them. So in this case, let's suppose we want to search over documents. Um, you can create a representation of documents in a kind of a similar way to how you create this representation of words. And um, the idea is to find the document that's most relevant. So in this case, we've got some representations of Shakespeare plays. So we've got As You Like It, Twelfth Night, Julius Caesar and Henry V. And um, suppose we want to query, our query is the vector, is a vector for the word fool, which we're just going to take as equal to the, um, to the basis dimension fool in this case. Now, if our query is, is fool, just along here, then um, we're going to return our, the, the, um, the way that we query the vector space is by essentially looking for the closest vector. So you can see that in, in a kind of quantum framework, this kind of closest vector um, search is, is relevant. Um, and then the, the relevance of an entity to a query is modeled as 
proximity in the semantic space. So the query full would return 12th night, then as you like it, then Julius Caesar, and then Henry V. And you can also model more complex queries than this. Um, so the so quantum logic uh, from Birkhoff and von Neumann has been used um, to formulate queries in information retrieval problems. So one of these ideas is that modeling the negation, you can model the negation of the word of a word as the orthogonal subspace to the word. So then if you want to query, if you're interested in cats rather than cars, and you want to find out about Jaguars, you can make a query Jaguar not car, that's then going to give you facts about, about big cats rather than facts about cars. Um, so the idea is that the, a, the vector for Jaguar is projected onto the vector, onto the subspace orthogonal to car, and, um, and then that, the resulting vector is then used as your query vector uh, when you're querying the, um, the database. There are some examples here. So we have, um, so in this, in this paper by Widows and Peters, if you're interested in suits but not lawsuits, well, if you just query at the vector space, if you find the closest vectors to suit in a general vector space, you'll get lots of um, queries related to lawsuits. So we've got lawsuit, plaintiff, damages, and so on. If you form the, um, the query suit, not lawsuit, so we've taken suit, projected it down onto the subspace orthogonal to lawsuit, and then, um, and then use that vector as the query, then we come up with, um, with items of clothing instead. And we get a similar um, result for play, not game. Okay, so I think I'll skip over these um, these quite quickly, but uh, just so so there has been um, a fair bit of research into um, quantum approaches in information retrieval. So one is to encode a document um, basically as a as a density matrix that encodes the um, that encodes the kind of uh, probabilities of seeing words close to each other. Again, I think ask me in the um, ask me in question time if you want to if you want me to cover this in more detail. And um, this paper um, by uh, Li Wang and Malucci actually won the best paper award at um, NACL 2019. So NACL is a um, very highly regarded um, conference in, um, in natural language processing. Um, this one, so this, um, this quantum inspired approach won best paper award. And so we can see that the, the, um, the, the, these sorts of approaches are very highly thought of within the computational linguistics um, field. So here we have, for example, we have a question. So here's vectors for each of the words in the question, the vectors are pairwise mixed into density matrices, and then um, some measurements are create are taken to give probabilities of um, uh, to yeah to give these vectors of probabilities, and then those are processed in some way. The benefit of this was that it was seen as actually very explainable, because all that was um, tuned were these measurement um, with these measurement um, matrices, vectors rather, and the original vectors that were put in. Okay, so an interim summary for this section, we, so we have information retrieval um, and question answering. And essentially in both of these cases, um, uh, these have been quantum logic or quantum approaches have been used as a way of, of um, of kind of improving these methods. Okay, so I'm going to move on to compositional approaches in vector semantics. So how can we build up meanings for sentences? So 
before I gave you a little um, example where um, a little example of uh, of some blacked out uh, words and um, and asked you to guess what the word was. Can you do the same thing for these sentences? Well, probably not. I mean, you know they're going to be about elephants, but you don't really you can't really say any what they're about in any detail. So the so what we want to be able to do then is we want to be able to um, build up representations of sentences just based on the representations of words and also some kind of combination mechanism for the words. So there have been a few approaches to this. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about um, one that was introduced in the 90s by Paul Smolensky. Um, and these are called tensor product representations. So these weren't overtly quantum, but they have um, since been used um, to uh, kind of to, as, uh, I don't think they've yet been implemented, but certainly quantum algorithms have been proposed that could implement this sort of thing. So um, the idea behind this is that what we want to do is to build up some kind of symbolic structure within um, a vector space. So um, to build up that symbolic structure, we're going to take, we're going to have a set of um, roles, which are the kind of uh, basic um, building blocks of the structure. And we're going to have some fillers, which are the things that you put into the structure to kind of give it meaning. And we have a notion of binding the roles and fillers together. When we instantiate this in, um, in a vector space model, we're going to have a, um, a filler um, and we're going to take the tensor product of that filler with a role vector. And then the structure is then just going to be the, the sum um, over your set of filler role bindings. So we have a set of fillers and roles and we add them together. So as an example, we might have the, the structure that we want might be a parse tree. So on this parse tree, we've got um, our sentence uh, S, I'm just going to um, bring up the, uh, just wondering, okay, hopefully you can all see my cursor. So we're going to bring up, um, we're going to have a sentence S, which is going to be decomposed into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Um, so we have a binary tree with these left and right subtrees. So we could represent that as S, um, is equal to our filler noun phrase tensored with some role that says branch left plus a verb phrase tensored with some role that says branch right. Um, and then we can also decompose the, um, the verb phrase into something else. Um, so now we've got the sentence is noun phrase together with a transitive verb and another noun phrase. And um, we, we can form a kind of vector representation of these by um, expanding out the filler into, um, into its, own, its own little binary tree here. Um, and then the uh, and then we get these role vectors that are now kind of more complex than the previous role vectors. They essentially say branch um, branch left uh, from the right hand branch, branch left and right. Now you'll notice then that we we just we have this addition symbol here, but of course. This um, this uh, quantity is in a kind of a different space to this to these ones. So um, Smolensky kind of deals with this by um, by embedding each of these vector representations into a, a Fox space. And you'll also notice that when you do this, the space can become arbitrarily large. Um, so there's various ways of dealing with this, and there's a whole field into this um, sort of representation 
called um, vector symbolic architectures. Um, so you can look up works by Gaylor, uh, Canerva. Um, more recently, uh, Elias Smith has has also um, done research into into representing language in this way. Um, however, the uh, the kind of work that uh, that that I work on um, and um, and which is which arguably solves some of these problems is to look at composition differently. So this um, this is now going to introduce you to the categorical uh, compositional distributional model of meaning, which we call we also call disco cat. And the idea behind this is that we want to use grammatical structure to um, compose our vector representations together. So if we take a gr the grammatical structure for this sentence, smelly baby cuddles dad, and we take some kind of vector-based representation over here, how can we combine the two of them um, to, to get a representation of this? And the representation is going to look like this. Um, it, you might be very familiar with this sort of diagram, um, uh, but if you're not, I'll go through it in now in a bit of detail. So first of all, we, um, we start with a, um, a representation of grammar. So, um, so pre-group grammar is based on the notion of a pre-group. So this is a partially ordered monoid with left and right adjoints. So we've got our set here, um, monoid multiplication and so on, the left and right adjoints. And the left and right adjoints need to interact with the unit in, in, this, in the following way. So, so the tensor product is just concatenation. And what we want to say is that um, if you have a, um, if you have the left adjoint of an element on the left of the same type of element, this reduces to one. If you have the right adjoint of an element to the right of uh, that element, that also reduces to one. And we can also expand out as well. So we, um, so we model this on, um, using the set, a set P, which just has the elements N for noun and S for sentence. And then we form, um, we could form, for example, a transitive verb. So a transitive verb, um, at least in English, uh, has, um, it needs to accept a noun on the left of it, a noun on the right of it, and, um, and it will then uh, reduce down to the sentence type S. So if we have, for example, the sentence clowns tell jokes, we see that we have the, um, we see that we have the transitive verb um, tell re represented by, um, by this string of types. And then we put a noun type for clowns to the left of it, a noun type for jokes to the right of it. And then following the rules that we talked about here, we can reduce this down to the sentence type S. And if a string of types does indeed reduce down to S, then we judge the sentence to have been grammatical. So here's a question for you. Um, what in English, what has type, um, what, what grammatical um, type has type uh, N, N, L? So this is going to be a type such that if you put it to the, so if you put a noun to the, uh, if you put it to the left of a noun, it's going to reduce down to a noun. So has anyone got any ideas in the chat? Let me have a quick look. So Miriam says adjective, any advances on adjective? Henri says adjective. Um, yeah, so agreed. I, so yeah, so this has type, this is the type, has the type of an adjective. Okay. So 
We can then um, build up a mapping to finite dimensional vector spaces. Um, and we do that in the following way. So we've got a mapping from um, each type um, to a vector space. So we say this, uh, my, my noun type is going to map to a, a space for nouns, which we might build in the way that we described earlier. And my sentence type is going to map to a type for sentences. Um, the tensor product in, um, in pre-group grammar, uh, the, sorry, the monoidal product in pre-group grammar is going to map over to tensor product of vector spaces. The right and left adjoints map over to the dual of a space. And um, these inequalities uh, essentially map over to, um, to uh, this ends up being the, taking the, the trace um, and, um, and taking identity matrices. Um, so if you're familiar, so this, so the underlying, um, the underlying structure here, if, if you're familiar with it, is, um, is that of a compact closed category. So essentially, the, um, a pre-group grammar is, uh, has the structure of a compact closed category, and we build up a functor that maps over to finite dimensional vector spaces in that, um, using the, in a way that preserves the structure that we need. And we have, um, and this has a, a diagrammatic calculus as well. Um, so in the interest of time, I think I'll just um, push on through this. So now what's happening? Well, we've got, we, um, we build up word. We build up word vectors. So each um, each noun is just represented as a vector. Um, adjectives are represented as linear maps that take nouns to nouns, and then um, transitive verbs are modelled as multilinear maps that take two nouns and map them down to one sentence type. So the one of the one of the key differences with the um, with the tensor product representation model that I um, talked about earlier is that now we're mapping everything down into one shared sentence space. So, um, so the the um, so any sentence, you know, no matter so any sentence of the same kind of type. So you want sentences all to be of one um, grammatical type. So here we have a declarative sentence. Um, all, um, all different kinds of sentences, no matter how long they are or whether they have subclauses or whatever, can all map down into this one shared sentence space. And this makes it much easier to compare um, to compare these, these things. And there's been a range of research into actually kind of implementing this, um, looking at sentence similarity and also extending the um, extending the um, uh, the model out to um, looking at what I call information routing words. So you have, for example, some words um, can be thought of as just more routing information around a sentence rather than actually having any lexical content. So, for example, here we've got um, children that love ice creams and ice creams that children love. The, the word that here is called a, a relative pronoun and its grammatical type would be, if, if we tried to learn all the parameters for this, it would be um, a grammatical type in a um, tensor product of three copies of the noun space and one copy of the sentence space. So that would, um, that would essentially end up being something very big. So instead, um, what um, Sardrazade, Clark, and Cooker have done is to um, uh, is to propose a sort of um, just a mathematical description of of what that should be, rather than rather than having to actually learn the parameters for the um, for the uh, uh, representation. Okay, so. Interim summary here, the idea is that we want to be able to compose words together to form phrases and sentences. I talked briefly about this role filler approach, um, and then I've talked a bit about the compositional distributional model. Um, 
where words inhabit different vector spaces based on their grammatical type. And um, words can then be combined to form phrases and sentences. Um, so does anyone see any problems? Um, so maybe um, you, Kirsty, you could shout out in the, um, if, there's, if anyone says in the chat, if they see any problems with this, uh, with this sort of um, representation. Yes, so in principle, there was a very long discussion about particular details, but this was really much more a discussion than, than a question which is left unanswered. Mm -hmm. Maybe there was one, one particular question which, which it was not answered in mm -hmm. the chat, and, and it is, what would be the type of a pronoun in this case? N to the power of R or the index R. This is the question, the pronoun. A pronoun? Yeah. Um, so, so these, um, so uh, we we have like, um, so yes, I I can't remember off the top of my head what the actual type of a pronoun is, but so here these are relative pronouns, but we also have um, uh, the the same kind of um, the same sort of thing has been done for possessive pronouns, so things like her um, or whose. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I can't, yeah, I can't think off the top of my head what the actual grammatical type would be, but these things are, um, are like highly studied in, in sort of linguistics. So there, there will be answers. I can, I can sort of find out and give some, uh, give some ideas. So- um, I have another question, but maybe we leave it for, for the end. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up. We are 10:45 yeah. already, so so please please have yeah, it. Yeah, I'll just I'm sure uh, you do. Yeah. Okay, so problems with this kind of representation is that arguably the representations are quite brittle in the sense that you have to you have to decide on a particular um, type for a word. You can't sort of switch between types. Um, the representations are thin, so the so that means like they they you have a, a sort of a point in a vector space but there's no there's, there's not that much internal structure to them um, there's lots of parameters to learn um, they're also static um, and there are issues with the the pre-group grammar as well I'm not going to talk too much about the issues with the grammar that's uh, maybe for somebody else's talk um, but I will talk about how to address these problems of um, the sort of uh, of putting more structure into the representations. So I'm going to brief, I'll try and rattle through these slides quite quickly. So essentially, one of the things that, that words have is quite a lot of hierarchical structure. So, so this means that, for example, um, we have, uh, so we have hierarchical information in our words. So here we've got, for example, motor vehicle. Um, so a motor car is a kind of motor vehicle, a hatchback is a kind of motor car and so on. There's hierarchical structure within a vector space. So how are we going to, um, to represent this? Well, one of the things that we can do is, um, is to represent is words and phrases as positive operators instead of just as vectors. And the nice thing about doing this is that, um, although I won't go into it here, it, the um, representing words as positive operators means that you can embed your word representations into exactly the same compositional structure. So um, into a, a compact closed category. Um, so if, if you do know about these things, the category is going to be um, CPM over F hill. Um, so we have the category of completely positive maps and uh, sorry, vector spaces and completely positive maps between them. So how are we going to actually build these out of, um, how are we going to build these? Well, first of all, given a word vector, um, we can first of all just lift it to the projection matrix that's associated with that vector. And that's a, an easy way of starting. And we can then represent more general terms as sums of more specific terms. So we might say that the general term pet is going to be some mixture 
of uh, dog, cat, tarantula, and so on. So these um, positive operators then have a natural ordering called the Lerfner ordering. And we interpret this ordering as um, the relation of hyponymy. So hyponymy is this is a relation. Um, so how can we kind of concretely build these? Well, um, first of all, so one proposal was as follows. We, we build um, a matrix um, based on co-occurrence with unordered pairs of words. So now instead of just looking at co-occurrence with words themselves, we look at co-occurrence with pairs of words. Um, build a symmetric matrix out of this, one for each word, and then we can enforce positive semi-definiteness. Um, another um, option would be to take mixtures of the context words. So we say if dog co-occurs with fur, bark and run, then the matrix for dog could be um, calculated as the mixture of the rank one projectors corresponding to the word vectors for fur, bark and run. And these weights here could be derived from how um, likely they are to actually occur with these. Um, another way of doing that is um, to, to get hierarchical information from an external source. So there's a database called WordNet, which has all this hierarchical information in it. And then given some off the shelf vectors, we can then kind of combine these together to, um, to form a, a representation of, of a given word. So motor car would be a mixture of uh, hatchback, compact, and gas guzzler, for example. Um, and we can then compose these uh, representations together. And in experiments, um, we find that actually these, these um, representations do work quite well. So we can test them on single word relations, looking at, for example, whether cat is an instance of mammal. And then we can, we interpret the hyponymy relation also as a kind of simple entailment relation um, and examining um, whether these, uh, whether the, uh, whether the right kind of relation holds between sentence representations, representations of summer finish, season end, which should hold versus, for example, season end, summer finish. Um, I'm going to skip the um, section on negation. Um, another, uh, another approach to, to looking at hierarchy in vector spaces is by um, Ty Dene Bradley and uh, um, Yanis uh, Vlasopoulos. And so here they build, um, they build a, um, a kind of representation over a different space. So this is a, a, a space, um, a complex Hilbert space, where the um, where which is a product of um, all the kind of set. So so S here is the set of sequences of words in a vocabulary of some fixed length. So let's say we've got our vocabulary here, and we've got a kind of product of of those particular. Of, um, of those sets, giving us a sort of set of different sequences. Um, we generate a state which re represents the actual observed probabilities of each sequence up to length n in the, um, in the corpus. So you probably see, so for example, for the sequence dog barks, that's gonna have a higher probability than a sequence bark dog because you don't, we don't really see that. And then a representation just on, uh, so a density matrix just over the, the kind of vocabulary space is then formed by, um, by uh, forming the, um, by uh, basically uh, forming the, the pure state, the, um, the projector over this, um, this state psi and then tracing out over um, every part of it, um, apart from the, 
the last one. And they then show that, that if you then hold certain, um, if, if you want to know the, um, a representation for a particular sequence um, of words, then you can hold those elements fixed and just trace out over the other elements. Um, this has got a, uh, so there's a very nice explanation of this on, um, on Bradley's blog here. And, um, and essentially what they show is that using the same ordering, the Lerfner order on, on vector spaces, we have, um, you have a kind of measure of generality. So we have dog is more general than black dog is more general than small black dog and so on. Okay, so here what we've done is we've looked at um, word representations that have this inbuilt notion of hierarchy and that can fit within a composition framework. So there's still a lot of questions that can be um, asked about here, like for example, how to build in other logical operations, how we can extend to larger scale data sets and so on. So kind of finally, um, I'll talk uh, a little bit about density matrices for ambiguity and polysemy. So the problem of ambiguity is obviously that lots and lots of, so many, most, many words have lots of different um, meanings. And uh, Dimitri Kartsaklis showed that if you do disambiguate meanings of words, you get better performance in sentence similarity tasks. But this can become very complex because when you're disambiguating words, you need to make sure you're disambiguating to the right meaning. And that's going to be dependent on all the other meanings of all the other words. So um, ideally, what we'd like to be able to do is to ha have a representation that can disambiguate within, um, within the process of composition. So, um, so one uh, approach to um, building density matrices um, looks at building these within different, um, uh, builds up a, uh, a kind of vector space that is built up of different uh, grammatical types, and then mixing these um, mixing these uh, individual um, instances together. So we have here Jaguar used in this context is mixed together with Jaguar used in this context, mixed together with Jaguar used in this context. So the idea of using density matrices to encode ambiguity is very kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, and what, um, and uh, Robin uh, Piedeleur, um, Dimitri Kartsaklis, uh, Bob and Manouche um, basically work, uh, showed that uh, we, can, we can use these representations within, a, um, within this compositional model of meaning. And that when we do, compose words together, um, we, we do see that the, um, that the ambiguity, so the ambiguity here is measured by the uh, von Neumann entropy of the, um, of the, of the density matrix. As, the, as you combine them together, the, um, the ambiguity kind of reduces, the ambiguity resolves itself. And I think that happens in most cases um, here. So, so the idea here is if I if I say um, uh, organ organ that enchants or organ that aches, you're going to um, you're going to decide on a particular interpretation of the word organ. And there are also other kinds of ambiguities, such as um, uh, derivational ambiguity or ambiguity on different um, different uh, mean, uh, word types. And yeah, so interim summary here is that we can represent ambiguity in text very well, and um, there are various methods for building density matrices, and we can represent both semantic and syntactic ambiguity. Okay. Yeah. Ex excuse me. Unfortunately, I think we are coming to the moment. We have, perhaps we need to consider. Yeah. 
if someone oh. would wish to ask questions. I'll, yeah, I'll stop. I was just going to say that I won't explain this because I know the next talk is about this. So <laughs> there we go. Overall <laughs> summary. <laughs> okay, so okay. thanks a lot. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you. Sorry for running over. There. No problem. Just in time. So the question is whether we have more questions. Yes, there is there is some question, I guess, or, or not, because because there was a lot of discussion in the meantime. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious whether there are questions with, with Sam because in there is something. Okay, there many people say thank you in a way. So 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 I, I have plenty of questions to be honest, and I cannot ask them because there is there is no time for that. Maybe I will ask one, but yeah, okay, they are. There are more comments on the chat, but the question.